Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. All right, so you're there in Leviticus chapter 5. We are going to crown King Jesus today. He's going to show us about our sins. This is the trespass offering. We're going to read beginning in chapter 5, verse 1, and we'll bring, let's see, we'll read down through verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 1 of the book of Leviticus, 1 through 6. Chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, we'll read down through verse 6. And if a soul sin, and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of an unclean cattle or the carcass of an unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of a man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall defile with, be defiled withal, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of those things. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he hath sinned. A female from the flock a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. I want you to hear this little illustration that uh, T.L. Culver uh, gave years and years ago, and it really kind of speaks to this whole idea of the trespass and our duty to deal with our own trespasses. He says this, Cover sin over as much as we may and smother it down as carefully as we can. It will break out. Many years ago, the packet ship Poland was bound for Herv with a cargo of cotton on board. By some singular accident, the cotton took fire clear down in the hold. The captain, finding that he could not reach the fire, undertook to smother it, but in vain. Then he caulked down the hatchways, but the deck grew so hot that neither the passengers nor the crew could stand on it. At length he fired a signal gun in distress, put all his people into boats, and left the doomed ship to her fate. He watched as she plowed gallantly through the waves, with all her canvas on. But ere she sunk below the horizon, the fire burst forth in a sheet of flame to the masthead. That ill-fated packet carrying the fatal fire in her own hold is a vivid picture of the moral condition of thousands of men and women. They cover their sins by all manner of concealments, but the deadly thing remains underneath in the heart, and if it does not burst forth in this world, it will in the next. The danger of covering sin. And so we come to chapter 5 in the book of Leviticus, and you say to me, well, Pastor, why do we have this chapter? Because we've already talked about the sin offering, and the sin offering dealt with the sins of the, if you sin against the commandments. Well, the, the trespass offering is like the sin offering, very much like the sin offering. As a matter of fact, as you read uh, verse 6, you'll see that the person who comes to the priest brings the same thing prescribed in the sin offering for the trespass offering. The same, it's the same prescription, but it's a different sin. I like to think of it this way. In chapter 4 in the, in the sin offering, we have the general. We don't have the specific because the Lord said, if you break any of the commandments of the Lord, now we know what those are, and, and you know we know exactly how they're to be observed, but what if a man says, well, I've not, I've not stolen anything, Okay. Maybe you've not stolen anything, but what have you done specifically that might be against the idea of stealing? Perhaps you've not done your best to to further the outward state of yourself, your family, or your neighbor. So that's where the trespass offering comes in. The sin offering is sort of like the generalized idea 
of sin. We understand it. It's defined for us. We know what the punishment is. We know what the remedy is, all of that. But now we come to the trespass offering, and I like to think of this as the practical application of that sin offering. I've I've kind of named this the bumping around variety of sin, right? Because we walk through this life, and folks, we're going to get our feet dirty. Our clothes are going to get messy, and it's going to happen. Yesterday, I was outside working in the yard, and I had my overalls on, and uh, I had worked on the car, and then I was working in the yard a little bit, and I hadn't gotten too dirty. And then I decided, oh, I'm going to take the, uh, the chairs off of the table and turn them you know, right side up so you could sit on them. And when I did that, water just came out of the bottom of the chair and went all over my britches, and it was rusty water. And when Denise washed them, she said, it didn't come out because I was bumping around. I didn't mean to. It wasn't something I meant to do, but it just happened. And all of a sudden, I get stained because of that rusty water in one of those chair legs. So this whole bumping around variety is given to us here in four statements in the first part of the chapter. The first one is, if a soul sin. Okay, I think we've already established that there's really not an if there, is there? When you're bumping around in life, this just kind of happens. If a soul sin. Well, why don't we just say if and when a soul sins? And here's the voice of swearing and his witness, whether he hath seen or known of it. If he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Okay, this one is a little bit confusing. But the idea here is that we have a responsibility to be a faithful witness. If you see a crime and you don't report the crime, then are you culpable? If you see somebody break into your neighbor's house and you don't call the police... Or if you see somebody break into your neighbor's house and something bad happens and they go to trial and they're calling for somebody who was a witness to that act and you stay quiet, that's what this is about. This is culpability in the fact that we don't speak. It's not that we do something, but that we don't do something. This points back to the ninth commandment, doesn't it? Witness bearing in truth is essential for me. It's essential for my neighbor. It's in, it is essential for the entire community because witness bearing in truth is something that maintains the power of our judicial system and keeps people safe. This is an important one. The, and I, I've classed this as something that happens with the ear, what we hear. Be careful of what you hear. And then notice verse 2. Or... If a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of an unclean cattle, the carcass of an unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. There are plenty of things in this life, things heard, things read, things seen, that can produce an unclean condition in our soul. Now, for the people in this day, in Moses' day, it was really something about touching. We're not talking here in the Christian church about touching, but we're talking about engaging in uncleanness that's all around us every day. And sometimes you just can't help but bumping into it. There are plenty of things that do that to us. We must be more discriminating in our choices and more disciplined in our walk so that we're careful about bumping into those unclean things. Because once we bump into them, sometimes we're tempted by them. And the temptation leads to more sin. So we must be careful. Lots of things that our hands touch, that our ears hear, that our eyes see. Lots of things that we bring to our breasts that we should never have embraced. The uncleanness of this world is all about us, and Jesus calls us to holiness. How in the world does a Christian live a holy life in the midst of this corrupt generation? Well, we have a remedy for it here. And then you'll notice verse 3. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. Now for the Christian, this still has a powerful application. Now we're not talking about as much about necessarily bumping into somebody else's uncleanness, although that could apply to this as well as to the one we just read in verse 2. And if we want an idea of what uncleanness looks like, I'm sure we could ask one of our nurses today about human uncleanness, and they could tell us all about it. But I think this has a more powerful application for the believer when we talk about our own uncleanness. Listen to the apostle. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said, For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as also we have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness." He comes right down where the rubber meets the road here in 1 first, in first Thessalonians chapter 4. And he says, fornication is uncleanness. Know how to hold your vessel in honor and sanctification. That's important. Because it's not, as I said, the uncleanness of other men that I bump into so much that I have a trouble with. It's my own uncleanness that I have trouble with. And I bump into that every day. Every day I get up and look in the mirror and I bump into my own uncleanness. So be careful. Do as the apostle says. Hold your vessel in sanctification. Abstain from fornication. Sanctification and honor. It's the way, not the lust of concupiscence. Now that's just an old-fashioned word that means lust or desire. Don't hold it in that. No. No, no, no. We are called to... Holiness, not to uncleanness. God has called us to that. And so here, in Leviticus chapter 5, we're not talking about just any kind of generalized idea of sin. No, we're talking something specific, the uncleanness of men. And ladies and gentlemen, we struggle with that every day. We struggle with things on the outside that are unclean. We struggle with things on the inside that are unclean. We struggle with things that we hear, and notice verse 4, we struggle with things that we say. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him. You know, this is the idea here, if it's hid from him, then you're also guilty of that. But one day it will come to light, and what do you do when it does? Well, you need to take care of it. We are so loose with our words. We know we're careful about taking the Lord's name in vain. But we're not quite as careful about the things that we swear we will do or swear that we won't do. And the Lord's concerned about those words too. That kind of loose talking is damaging to our souls and the souls of others. People don't need to hear us talk like that. How does that reflect Christ? Oh, I'm going to blah, 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 blah. We pronounce some oath, some swear against somebody that's harmed us. We swear about something we're going to do. We puff ourselves up with pride and say, this is what I'm going to do for the Lord or something like that. Be careful. Be very careful about what you say and then not do it. That kind of loose talk, as I said, is damaging to our souls and the souls of others. Listen to the preacher in Ecclesiastes. He says, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou vowest. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not, and this is the payoff verse right here. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Oh, yes, sir. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel, it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Yeah. So you see when I say this is the bumping around variety, the trespass variety is the bumping around variety. This is the stuff that we have to deal with all the time, all the time. And so we need to focus on it. And you notice the last thing that's it's mentioned there in, what is that, verse, verse 4? He says, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these Charles Simeon said, that moment when we see that we have sinned, we didn't know it at the time. What we did was, was ignorant, and it was done out of pride. Or it, was, it was done out of some hubris, or it was done out of some temptation. We didn't recognize it as sin at the moment we did it. But then, guess what? The Holy Spirit comes in, and he says, hey, we need to take care of something here. We need to take care of those words. We need to take care of those thoughts. We need to take care of that action. We need to take care of what you heard. 
Then the Holy Spirit comes in. He does his work, and we know it. What do we do? Well, Simeon says, in the moment that we have sinned, we should seek for mercy in God's appointed way. So what is the appointed way? Well, in verse 5, we have the prescription. And here I'll just close out with the prescription today. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. Yeah, confession. This is new. Actually, we didn't have anything about confession in chapter 4, but here in chapter 5 we do. In chapter 4, we laid our hands on the head of the animal, and I said the rabbis you know, thought that maybe there was some whispering that was going on in the ear of the animal. Perhaps that's true, but not here. That is right out in the open. You come with your offering, and the very first thing you do is confess. I did this. Listen to David and listen to Achan. David in Psalm 51, 4 said, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest. David said, don't look anywhere else, right here. Achan said, when he stood before Joshua, Joshua said to him, My son, give, I pray thee, glory unto the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Yeah, and you know, that's the same plea that we hear from the Spirit of God, too, about these things. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. It is it behooves us, ladies and gentlemen, to have a thus and thus conversation with the Lord. And Achan goes on and he describes, he says, Well, when I saw the good the goodly Babylonian garment, and when I saw the wedge of silver, and when I saw the gold, I lusted after them and I took them. He just came right up. Told exactly what happened. It's time for us to do the same thing. Because remember my illustration at the beginning. If you let the fire burn in the hole and you know it's there. And you don't treat it. Dr. Henry says, deceit lies in generals. But the way to be well assured of pardon and to be well armed against sin for the future is to be particular in our penitent confessions. Particular in our penitent confessions. You say, well, I'm a born-again believer. Jesus has taken care of all my sin. He certainly has. And the blood of Jesus makes a way for you to stand before the mercy seat of God. But, friend, I'm going to tell you, you still need to take care of that sin because the blood of Jesus took care of that present sin as well. And the only reason you can come and confess to him and have an advocate with the Father is because Jesus Christ made the way for that to happen. And you want to deal with that sin, not let it slide. It will affect your soul, it will damage your soul, and it will not give you peace. And as Dr. Collier said, once the fire burns, it either burns in this life or the next. Verse 6 says, He shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he hath sinned. You see, so it is for us when we stand before our great high priest to confess our sin, it must be done before the Lord. This is who our confessor is. He's the one we go to. We take it to him. He can cleanse us and he can forgive us. It says there, a sin offering is a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a, notice this, a sin offering. So it points back to the prescription for the sin offering. If if you've created a trespass and you need to come, number one, you confess that. You come before the Lord with your offering. You take your animal. You you go through the entire prescription for the sin offering. You lay your head on the head of that animal. You kill that animal. The priest takes the blood, and he smears the blood on the horns of that altar and then pours the blood out at the basin. And then the fat of that offering goes on the altar, and the rest of it is burned outside the camp. So just like the sin offering is what we have here. And, of course, it's the priest that does it. Because we have a high priest. This still again points to Jesus. This is an atonement for the specific sin. Because the worshiper is already in communion with God. Through the whole burnt offering. Which each individual sin. So that each individual sin can be dealt with. I'm so looking forward to preaching about the. We're going to go back to the whole burnt offering next week. And look at what the priest did with that in chapter 6. Let me conclude with these words. These are the words of Charles Simeon. 
And he wrote these words at the end of one of his sermons. He said, how wonderful must be the efficacy of the blood of Christ. Let only one man's sins be set forth, and they will be found numberless as the sands upon the seashore. Yet the blood of Christ can cleanse not him only, but a whole world of sinners. Yea, all who stand ever to exist to the very end of time. Moreover, his one offering can cleanse them not merely from sins of ignorance, but even from presumptuous sins, for which no remedy whatsoever was appointed by the law of Moses. What of you does this give us of the death of Christ? Oh, that we could realize in our minds, just as the offender under the law realized the substitution of the animal which he presented to the priest to be offered in his stead, Then should we have a just apprehension of his dignity and a becoming sense of his love. Let us then carry to him our crimson sins, not doubting that they shall all be purged away. And we may rest assured that in a little time we shall join the heavenly choir in singing these words, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, In his own blood be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Friend, come and deal with your sin. Do not let it burn in your heart. Do not say it's too little for God to forgive. Do not say Jesus doesn't have the time. No, do some soul care and do it today. You know what it is. You've not confessed it yet. Time now to do it. You've heard the word of God speak to your heart. This is no coincidence. This is not some happenstance. He's speaking to you about that thing. Get rid of it. Plead the blood of Jesus. Come to your high priest, your advocate, and ask him for this cleansing. Quickly before the fire burns and your soul is further damaged. Do it today. Do not wait. Do it today. And let us all with one heart and one voice praise the Savior who gave himself to do this work in us. We of all men have the most hope. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.